Welcome to the One Minute Apologist. My name is Bobby Conway and I am here with Dr. Michael Brown. It's good to be with you, sir. Great to be with you, thanks. One of the questions I'd like to ask you on today's program is the question, can a Jew be saved? You know, Jesus came for the Jewish people first and foremost. He's not the son of Mr. and Mrs. Christ. He's the first human being in recorded history to be called a rabbi. He was Rabbi Yeshua. He didn't come to establish a new home and garden Sunday morning religion called Christianity, but to fulfill what was written in Moses and the prophets. And the big controversy in the early church is, can a Gentile be saved without first becoming a Jew? So absolutely, Jesus is for Jews. If Jesus is not for Jews, he's for no one. If Jesus is not the Messiah of Israel, he's not the savior of the world. Thank you so much. Sure thing. Shalom family, welcome. Uh, if you're just joining us, make sure and hit the thumbs up button, the like button. Every time you hit that thumbs up button, the like button, you are benefiting someone or more than one person because it reaches out to more and more people. So please hit the thumbs up, hit the like button, make a difference in someone's life. Today we're gonna to be learning from Tanakh the truth about sin, atonement, sacrifice, from the Hebrew Scriptures, Christians and Messianics, based on the New Testament, the Greek Scriptures, have their teachings from the book, from the New Testament, from the Greek, about sin and atonement. And what we're going to learn today is that the Hebrew Scriptures is completely contrary to the message that you see in the Christian or the Greek Scriptures. The Hebrew and the Greek sin, atonement, sacrifice. Let's look at Tanakh to understand. Now, the Christian side and the Messianic side will say, if you don't believe in Jesus or don't follow the way of Yeshua or Jesus, believe in him, follow his way, you are damned. You're going to hell or whatever may be the claim. There's so many different denominations. So there's many different beliefs. But the bottom line is, you got to go through Jesus or Yeshua to get to the Father, to get that eternal reward and so forth and all the claims. It has to be through him. He was the final sacrifice. He died on behalf of our sins and so on and so forth. He was resurrected and he did miracles. There's all these things. But what does Tanakh teach? What does the Hebrew scripture, scripture excuse me, say about all of this? Today, you will have clarity if you listen, if you take note, if you study intensely and prayerfully for yourselves. With all the claims made in the New Testament, in the Greek scriptures, there's a passage from the book of Proverbs from wise King Solomon. With all these claims, there is one incredible quote, and I think it's very fitting to begin this subject. In Proverbs chapter 18, verse 17, wise King Solomon states, The first to state their case may seem right until another comes and cross-examines him. So what he is saying is, let's just say you're watching a court case, or you're in a courtroom watching a case, you are someone in the audience, and you only hear the prosecution, their side, they're giving all what they believe is evidence against the accused, right? You hear all the alleged evidence against this person. You might walk away if you only hear one side. You may walk away and say, you know what? This person is cooked. This, there's no way this person is not guilty. I mean, it's just overwhelming. What King Solomon, wise King Solomon, is saying here is that the first one to state their case, the prosecution will be the first one to state their case, may seem right until you listen to the defense, the counter-argument. You must hear both sides to come up with a rational conclusion and find the truth. Now here is the defense. So let's see what Tanakh, the Hebrew Scriptures, really teaches. To begin with, according to Tanakh, sin in Hebrew, which is hate, is an act of rebellion, not a state of being. 
as taught by the New Testament. It is an act of rebellion, not a state of being. The Tanakh actually teaches that as a result of Adam and Eve's choice, choice, not sin, not hate. Now, what does the word in Hebrew literally mean, hate? Hate means literally to miss the mark. For example, if you're shooting a bow and arrow, and the arrow misses the target off, it doesn't quite hit the target. This is what it means. Hate means to miss the mark, to be off the mark. So therefore, what does it take to get a bullseye? Practice. Working at it. And you will see that the term in Hebrew represents the realistic understanding of the real term hate, which is in Tanakh, which is more correct than the Christian or the messianic way of understanding sin. So again, mankind was given an inclination, inclination or a temptation to do evil. Now, some people will say this inclination is not biblical, is it? Let's see what the Torah says. Genesis chapter 8, verse 21 says this exact word. The inclination of man's heart is evil from his youth. So again, the term, I didn't just make it up. Jews didn't make it up. This is not an invention. This is something that you find in the Hebrew scriptures. It is an inclination. Okay, An inclination is a pull or a drive. It acts upon the person, but it is not the person. This inclination does not make a person a sinner. It does not make a person a sinner. Nor is he or she in a constant state of sin, as many believe, based on, again, the New Testament. Rather, they have a temptation to do evil, and a person is blessed with the freedom of choice and the ability to choose good over evil. This is explained, for example, in the example of the Garden of Eden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Once they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they had the awareness and the choice between good and evil. They were now aware that they did have a choice, whereas before they were more like the animals. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 15 says, I have placed life and death before, before you, blessing and the curse. So choose life, choose, choose, choose life in order that you may live. Deuteronomy chapter 35, verse 15 states, I have placed before you today life and what is good and death, what is evil. The ability to rule over evil is not just wishful thinking. Don't think that. It is a directive expressed in the following verse, which mentions sin, hate in Hebrew, by name the very first time in the entire Hebrew scriptures. This is in Genesis chapter 4, verse 7. Sin is crouching at the door, and it desires you. And then it says, but you will master over it, or you can rule over it. Sin, being the master over sin, God tells Cain that he can be the master over sin. Though we will be tempted, sin will be crouching behind the door trying to tempt you, to pull you, to do wickedness. You have the choice to do and master over hate, to master over sin. So even though you miss the mark or can miss the mark, which is hate in Hebrew, you can master by building up your spiritual muscles to eventually be able to hit the target on a regular basis. Now, are we expected to be perfect? Of course not. But we work at it. If sin is an insurmountable condition, something that you were born with, that no one can overcome, wouldn't this be a, a logical place that God should have told Cain, sorry, your parents blew it for you. Now go be a good boy and go get a sacrifice. Put the blood on the altar. 
But again, no. God tells Cain that you can be the master over hate, sin. Very problematic. King David said this in his well-known words in Psalms chapter 37, verse 27. Listen carefully. Turn, turn from evil and do good. Turn from evil and do good. Now, what does the New Testament do with this clear biblical teaching from Tanakh? They simply changed it. The church simply changes it. The author. We see in Isaiah chapter 59, verse 20. Listen to this. In the Tanakh, it says a Redeemer will come to Zion, meaning the future Mashiach, will come to Zion to those who turn from transgression in Jacob, who turn from transgression, turning from their sins. Now look what the the writer of Romans, which is Paul of Tarsus, look what he does with that same passage. He literally changes the words of God. Let's take a look at Romans chapter 11, verse 26. Again, he's supposed to be quoting the Hebrew Bible to prove his case, but look what he does. He literally changes the words. He quotes, the deliverer, the deliverer will come from, not to Zion, from Zion. He will remove, remove ungodliness from Jacob. Now, again, Isaiah says the Redeemer will come to Zion, not from Zion, to those in Jacob who turn from their sins, meaning on their own. They turn from their sins. He's coming to those who turn from their sins. Romans, Paul says, no, he will remove the sin from Jacob. He changes the word of God to make his point. The mistranslations of the words to Zion to from Zion is bad enough. And then he says, from those who turn from transgression, which is the Hebrew scriptures, to in Paul's letter, he will remove ungodliness, distorts the meaning and literally plagiarizes and changes, corrupts the text of the Holy Tanakh to make his point. What is repentance? Teshuvah means to repent. It literally means to return to God. If you want to be literally correct, returning to God. This is a process of regretting, forsaking sin, and also turning as demonstrated in a passage here in Isaiah chapter 55, verse 7, one of many. Listen to this. Let the wicked forsake his way. Let him return to Yehovah that he may abundantly forgive. Ezekiel chapter 18, which is very powerful, the entire chapter, highly recommend it. I always do to read it and study it. It says, when the wicked man turns away from his wickedness, which he has committed and practices justice and righteousness, he will save his life. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. If my people, God is speaking, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Very, very clear. What is the path to divine forgiveness in the Hebrew scriptures? Let's take a look. In 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 46 through 40, 53, excuse me, listen to this. If they sin against you, meaning Israel sins against God, Listen to what King Dave, uh, excuse me, King Solomon says. For there is no man that does not sin, and you be angry with them, and deliver them to the enemy, so that they carry them away captives into a land of the enemy, near or far. Yet if they shall bethink themselves, like change their thought, bethink themselves and get a hold of themselves, in the land where they were carried captives, and repent and make supplication unto you in the land of them that carried them captives, saying, We have sinned, we have done perversely, we have committed wickedness, and return to you with all of their heart and with all of their soul in the land of their enemies, 
which let them away captive and pray toward their land. This is why we, the Jews, pray towards the land. The fakers don't. You give unto their fathers the city which you have chosen and the house which I have built for your name. Then you will hear their prayer and supplication in heaven, your dwelling place, and maintain their cause. Meaning he will act upon the prayers. This was during the first temple when he just built the first temple. Now we know that the temple was destroyed and it was destroyed again. So they were able to repent even in biblical times twice. To have it built. Second Chronicles, excuse me, uh, Ezekiel chapter 33, verses 10 through 11, and verses 14 through 16. Now you, son of man, say to the house of Israel, Thus have you spoken, since our sins are upon us and we are wasted away because of them, how can we live? He's asking, How can we live? Say to them, As I live, declares the Lord God, I do not desire the death of the wicked one, but rather the return of the wicked one from his way, that he may live, repent, repent from your evil ways, he says. Why should you die, O house of Israel? So again, repent, repent. The focus is on repentance, turning from sin, not sacrifices. As we will learn as we further go into this, we will see that Sacrifice is the least important of all the things. He says, going on, 14 through 16. Again, though I say to the wicked, you shall surely die. Yet if they return and turn from their sin and do what is lawful and right, if the wicked restore the pledge, give back what they, what they have taken by robbery and walk in the statutes of life, committing no iniquity, they shall surely live. They shall not die. None of the sins that they have committed shall be remembered against them. They have done what is lawful and right. They shall surely live. This is the words of God. Again, no mention of sacrifice. It's about action. As I mentioned in many of my videos, the sacrifices are like the roses. It's like buying a bouquet of flowers. Well, that's wonderful. Bad guys give flowers. Bad guys give bouquets of roses, but still treat their women like garbage sometimes. People can give gifts, but what good is the gift if you don't change, if you're not a good person, right? That's the point that you will see over and over and over again. It's not what I'm saying. Who cares what I say? It's what the scripture says. Jeremiah chapter 36, verse 3. It may be that when the house of Judah hears of all the disasters that I intend to do to them, all of them may turn, again, turn, not go get a sacrifice. They will turn from their evil ways that I may forgive their iniquity and their sin. Now, what's missing here? The blood, the sacrifice. Now, am I saying blood and sacrifice is not important? No, I'm not. But that is not the focus, nor the most important factor of sin and atonement and forgiveness. Not at all. Daniel chapter 4, verse 24. Listen to this. Daniel gives counsel to the king. Therefore, O king, may my counsel be acceptable to you. Atone for your sins with righteousness, with goodness, he means. And your iniquities with mercy to the oppressed so that your prosperity may be prolonged. Jonah chapter 3, verses 6 through 10. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself in sackcloth, sat in ashes. Then he had made a proclamation in Nineveh. Now this is in Jonah chapter 3. Read the whole chapter. It's an incredible chapter in Jonah, where Jonah goes to the city of Nineveh, which God warns the city of Nineveh, who was very, very sinful. In 40 days, I'm going to destroy that city. You tell them. So he warns the city of Nineveh. In 40 days, God is going to destroy all of you, the whole place. 40 days. They get their act together. Now listen carefully. Now notice what is missing. 
What is missing from all of this? Look what they do. Then he made a proclamation in Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles. No human being nor animal nor herd nor flock shall taste anything. This is what they say in Nineveh, the king. They shall not feed nor shall they drink fasting, complete fasting. Um, human beings and animals shall be covered in sackcloth. They shall cry mightily to God. All shall turn from the evil ways and from the violence that is in their hands. Who knows, they say. God may relent and change his mind. He may turn from his fierce anger so that we do not perish. And listen to this. So, when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, what happened? Did he see their sacrifices, did their blood, right? He saw that they turned from their evil ways. God changed his mind about the evil that he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. It doesn't say he saw their blood or their sacrifices. He said he saw that they had turned, turned from their evil ways. Give me one moment, everyone. Okay, sorry about that. So again, God did not see that they were giving sacrifices and blood on the altar. What did they do? They turned, they, they, they fasted, they sat in ashes, sackcloth, crying mightily to God. Not a mention of blood and sacrifice because like I said, I am not making this up. This is in the scriptures. The focus of the Hebrew scriptures is not on blood and sacrifice. The focus is on changing, turning your life around by choice. Again, choosing right from wrong, good and evil. God said, today I place before you good and evil, life and death. Choose life. Ezekiel chapter 18 is replete with numerous verses that talks about if the wicked forsake their evil ways, not only does it say in chapter 18 of Ezekiel that God will forgive you for your sins and past sins, but the most beautiful thing of all is God literally says, your sins, your transgressions shall no longer be remembered. He will no longer remember the sins against you. The most beautiful promise of all. So not only forgiveness, but forgetting your past, which literally means whatever you did in your past, or even though you changed your life, you're worried about what you did a long time ago. God says, if you truly have changed your life, not only will he forgive you and have forgiven you, but he has also forgiven your past. And that is a comforting thought. This is how atonement doesn't work. Take, take a listen to these passages. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 8. Now, remember what I told you about the flowers and the roses. Here's an example. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 8. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. But the prayer of the upright, meaning the good one, is his delight. So if a bad guy comes who is an evil person that committed a sin and goes, oh, I know what I'll do. I will get a sacrifice, put the blood on the altar, because that's what you have to do, right? That's what the New Testament teaches. It's all about the sacrifice and the blood, right? The sinner is, is no matter what the sinner does, if he believes in Jesus, he's going to heaven, right? He could be a bad guy, do things over and over again. Well, I'm already forgiven because Jesus gave his blood for me, his sacrifice. That's not what the Hebrew Scriptures teaches. That's against. It's an abomination, it's an abomination to God himself, that kind of mentality. The sacrifice of the wicked, period, the sacrifice, the sacrifice, the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination, which means disgusting to God. But the prayer of the upright, meaning the good person, because you can be good, you can be righteous, 
and still be not perfect. Again, am I claiming this? Is this only a Jewish sort of thing? No, it's not. Proverbs chapter 24, verse 16 says, listen to this. The righteous man is someone who falls seven times and gets back up. I'll repeat it again. The righteous person is someone who falls seven times and gets back up. Not the perfect man, not a person that cannot do anything wrong. No, someone who falls down over and over again, but gets back up, who keeps working at getting better. Does God require perfection? Of course not. He knows that we are not perfect. Shalom, Jaden. Thank you for joining us. We're talking about sin and atonement, sacrifice in Tanakh. How it is completely different than the New Testament understanding of sacrifice and blood. So bear with me real quick here. Bear with me here. I'm sorry. Okay. Isaiah chapter 1. Listen carefully. This is very, very powerful. Isaiah chapter 1, starting with verse 11. God is speaking here, by the way, to all of Israel. He's screaming at all of Israel. He's saying, what to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord. I've had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or the lambs of he goats. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Here's, the, here's how you fix it. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. It's not about the sacrifice or the blood. Wash yourselves. Make yourself clean. Remove the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to doing evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rec rescue the oppressed. Defend the orphan. Plead for the widow. That's the point. It's by action. Action of changing your life. He says many times throughout the scripture in Isaiah chapter 1, for example, starting in verse 11, if you keep reading from 11 through 16, you will see that I don't care about the blood. I don't care how many sacrifices that you give me when you pray up to me, scream out to me with all this abomination. I'm going to hide my eyes. It's about changing your life. So if you are doing wrong and thinking that all it takes is a sacrifice or blood or believing in someone who did it for you because you're so worthless you can't do it for yourself this is not at all the word of god the hebrew scriptures teaches the opposite again proverbs 24 16 a righteous person is someone who falls seven times and gets back up you don't have to be perfect he doesn't expect perfection he expects effort Amos chapter 5, verses 22 through 24 teaches, Even though you offer me your burnt offerings, listen carefully, burnt offerings, right? You think that would qualify. Well, I'm, I'm covered, right? Wrong. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them, God says. And offerings of well-fed of your fatted animals, I will not look upon. Wait, what? Why is this? Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your harps, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. That's what he wants. That's the focus. Not the blood, not the sacrifice. It is what is inside of you. The transformation of you, yourself, not the outside. The outside is giving the flowers. Here you go, dear. I'm going to keep being late. I'm going to keep coming in late, not calling you, upsetting your spouse, disrespecting, and then you come home with the flowers. Here you go. Here's the sacrifice. Here you go. I'm not going to change, but here you go. I know you like flowers. She will throw it in your face. Micah chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. Listen again. With what shall I come before Yehovah and bow before myself before God on high? Shall I bow myself before God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings? Listen carefully, burnt offerings, right? Calves a year old, of course. This is all what the New Testament talks about, blood and sacrifice, right? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn, 
Sound familiar? Firstborn for my sins, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul. What should be the answer? Of course, that's what it's all about. That's the focus, right? Atonement, sacrifices, blood, that should be it, right? No, no, no. He has told you, O mortal man, what is good and what does Yehovah require of you? What does he require? To do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God in righteousness. Turn from your sins. Again, read Ezekiel 18. Read the whole chapter. Read it again. Read it three times. Psalm chapter 51, verses 15 through 17. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you have no delight in sacrifice. Are you hearing me? You have no delight in sacrifice. If I were to give you a burnt offering, you would not be pleased. The sacrifice acceptable to God is what? Is a broken spirit broken up inside of you. Broken up inside of you for what you have done wrong. That's what it means. A broken and contrite heart. My God, what have I done? Right? You do something wrong. You know you did something wrong. You cheated someone. You stole. You cheated on your wife or your husband. He wants you to be broken up to him. Not bringing a sacrifice. Not the blood. Being broken inside. Telling your wife or your husband or your spouse or the person you stole with, I am deeply hurting. I am so sorry for what I've done. I want to repay for that. I want to change my life. Repent. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise this. That is the focus. Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 3 through 7. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways and your doings by what? And let me dwell with you in this place. Do not trust these deceptive words. This is the temple of the Lord. The temple of the Lord, right? The focus, the focus, the temple of the Lord, right? For if you truly amend your ways, like it means fix your ways, change your way of life, and your doings, if you truly act justly with one another, if you do not oppress the stranger, the orphan, or the widow, or shed innocent blood in this place, if you do not go after other gods, to your own hurt, other gods, you shall have no other gods before me, the first commandment, that means there's no one else but the Father, if you have another god with him, meaning you know who, J.C., or Yeshua, that's a problem. You can't have more than one God, only one. Other gods to your own hurt. Then I will dwell with you in this place, only then. You can't keep the Torah and worship two gods, only one. In the land that I gave to old to your ancestors forever and ever. Again, do not go after other gods, other gods, other gods on my face, Al Panai, first commandment. You can keep the entire Torah, but you're disobeying the first commandment if you have another God with the Father. Period. There's no going around it. You are breaking the first commandment. Therefore, the Torah observance is null and void. I'm sorry to break it to you. There's only one God and one Savior. Isaiah 43, 10 and 11. Read it over and over and over again. Isaiah 43, verses 10 through 11. One God and one Savior. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22. We have a few more. And Samuel said, has the Lord great delight in burnt offerings? Again, does he have great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices? Or as in obeying the voice of Yehoah? Surely to obey is better than sacrifice. To heed is more important than the fat of rams. To obey is more important than sacrifice. Hosea chapter 6, verse 6. For I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. It can't get much more clear than that. 
Proverbs chapter 21, verse 3. To do righteousness and justice is more acceptable to Yehovah than sacrifice. Period. So this is just a rough, just a, a brief. There are many, many more pages I was going to go through. Unfortunately, I don't have the time. I will leave a link in the comment section to a fuller presentation of this topic, a full-blown presentation of this topic of great importance. So I hope this was enjoyable. I hope that you hit the thumbs up button, like, share, and go over this material for yourself. Take notes, study this prayerfully and carefully. Shalom and thank you so much for joining. Again, please hit the thumbs up button. Please help others to benefit from this teaching. Thank you again, and make sure you subscribe and hit the notification button. Thank you. Shalom.